During World War II on the Eastern Front, the Germans quickly realized this was simply not a fight they could win on their own. They had advanced deep into the heart of the Soviet Union, but they could barely fill this ridiculous long line with troops. Germany's allies weren't even enough to cover it. The Romanians were plentiful, but under-equipped and ineffective. The Slovaks were effective, but demographically they would never make the difference. The Hungarians were unwilling participants. The Italians were horribly under-equipped and ineffective, yet Mussolini kept sending more and more men into the mix, without Hitler even asking. The Bulgarians refused to join in with Hitler's war in the East, despite them joining the Axis to seek protection from the Soviets. The Germans would have to look elsewhere. Himmler and Gottlob Berger, chief of the SS main office, quickly came up with a solution. Until now, the German occupiers had been at a loss of what to do with the civilian population. Hitler gave no clear orders. They were greeted as liberators, and thousands offered to help the German cause, but as for now, they were only allowed to help in police battalions or the labour service. There was already foreign legions from the west. There was volunteer legions in the main army from all over Europe, and there were specific Germanic divisions from Scandinavia and the Low Countries, among others in the SS. As Germany began to struggle, the doubters began to realise the necessary steps that must be taken. They had to trust the occupied population. Those that worried in the first place need not have. The Ukrainians, Estonians, Latvians, and all the others on the Eastern Front were probably even more fanatical than the Germans themselves. Every single soldier would have had family, or at least a friend, that was murdered by the Soviets over the past few years, and were chomping at the bit to get revenge. As soon as they were given the option to join up, tens of thousands immediately volunteered. Of all the ethnic groups that volunteered, there was one that had far more recruits than any others, and surprisingly, that was the tiny Baltic nation of Latvia. This is their story. Firstly, a quick disclaimer before we begin. The SS is extremely controversial, but I urge you not to overthink this video. It is purely a work of history, and I will give no opinions of my own. I will simply be recounting what actually happened, and all views expressed will be those of the men themselves that were fighting, who I will quote from extensively. Thank you. And of course, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. YouTube doesn't monetize these videos immediately, and they all have to undergo a manual review before they are finally accepted up to a week later. As a result, I'm entirely reliant on these kind donations in order for me to make these videos for you guys as a full-time job, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. If you do want to sign up to support me, join the Discord or the Weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider clicking one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can possibly imagine. Thank you. For almost all of recent history, the Latvians have been ruled by Germans. Even when the Baltic states were seized by the Russians, the Baltic German nobility were the landowners, and the Latvians were the serfs. The idea that less than 30 years after their independence, they would be fighting side by side as inseparable allies was unthinkable at the time. In 1918 and 19, the map of Eastern Europe was completely redrawn. Austria-Hungary collapsed, and new nations such as Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia were formed. With the defeat of Germany and the collapse of Russia, Poland was formed. Along with them were other ethnic groups desperately fighting to grasp the opportunity to be free. Some were unsuccessful, such as the Ukrainians, but the Baltic states, against all odds, actually managed to pull it off. In a confusing war of independence, the new Latvian government was pushed all the way back to Leopaya, but here they managed to halt the Soviet advance. The Estonians in the north were far more successful, and thanks to this distraction, the Latvians, led by the immensely popular Karlis Ulmanis, managed to push forwards all the way through Korzume towards Riga, thanks to the help of both the British and the Germans. Eventually, the Germans overthrew the Latvian nationalist government, and tried to install a new pro-German government, ran by the Baltic German nobility. The Estonians, with their Latvian allies, now joined forces against the Germans. Logically, many of them saw this as the culmination of a long struggle between their Baltic German overlords and themselves. The Germans attacked but were quickly repelled by the highly motivated Bolts, and they were completely annihilated. The British Navy then turned up as the Latvians were about to capture Riga. At this, the Germans capitulated. There was a small amount of less organised German resistance later on, and they arranged an offensive, but once again, they were obliterated by the Latvians immediately. In early 1920, the war came to an end, as the Latvians, together with the help of Estonians, Lithuanians and Poles, pushed the Soviets out in the east. By mid-1920, all fighting came to an end, and Latvia was officially free to try their luck as an independent nation. During the interwar period, 
things went pretty well, and little Latvia surpassed the expectations of pretty much everyone. Latvia's standard of living blew past that of its neighbours, as the Ulmanis government tried to base itself off of the Western democracies, whom they had great relations with, and in their eyes, the British especially would be the guarantors of their independence, given the fact that they had helped them achieve it in the first place. They kept themselves out of trouble, and just plodded along, trying to make the best of their long-awaited independence. They truly tried to get along with their neighbours, and the major powers. For example, when it seemed as if every government in Europe was condoning the mass anti-Nazi Jewish boycotts in 1933, Latvia was the only nation to put their foot down and say no when the Germans asked them to, and this supply of food was invaluable for the Germans that winter, but it didn't help the strenuous relationship between Latvia and their nearly 100,000 Jews in the nation itself. Unfortunately for the Latvians, however, the old enemy had plans that weren't quite so peaceful. The Russians had tried to russify the Latvians over the past few decades of independence, and many massacres had occurred against the Latvians seeking more rights. For this reason, Latvians disproportionately threw their lot in with the Soviets before the independence war. They absolutely hated Tsarist Russia, and pretty much Russians in general. Now, they were back, but this time in the form of the Soviet Union. In 1939, the Allies had tried to court Stalin in an attempt to encircle Adolf Hitler. This way, he could be kept in his box, and eventually, toppled. Hitler, however, had no intention of letting this happen, and he reached out to Stalin instead to make him a better offer. The Allies sent their diplomats in an extremely slow old boat, and couldn't make up their minds about what to actually offer Stalin for an alliance. Stalin wanted the Baltic states, but the Brits couldn't make up their minds. Hitler could, and in his mind he was willing to make a deal with the devil, in order to not get encircled. Poland was split into spheres of influence, and in return, Stalin was given his free hand in the Baltic states. Hitler did this knowing full well what would befall the Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian people if Stalin went through with it, but ultimately if it meant sparing his people war, it was a worthwhile sacrifice. Plus, Hitler wasn't naive. He knew that eventually the two nations would come to blows, and this deal probably wasn't going to be permanent anyhow. In September 1939, the Soviets began continually violating Baltic airspace on intelligence missions, and the Red Navy was threatening Baltic ports. The following month, all three Baltic states were given an ultimatum by Stalin. They had no choice but to accept. In summary, Latvia was to lend Soviets naval and military bases, they were to build airfields for the Soviets to use, and they were to allow 30,000 Soviet troops to station themselves on Latvian soil. Hitler had a feeling that this wouldn't be the end of it. He thought that the Baltic states would soon be Sovietized, and that he had to get his people out of there, which he duly did. On the 30th of October 1939, the call went out, and by the following spring, 50,000 Baltic Germans returned to the German Reich. In early to mid-1940, the Soviets stepped their game up, and they began their usual subversive activities to destabilise the Baltics and find a pretext to invade. After months of these games and public denunciations of the Baltic governments, with all sorts of made-up accusations, they finally made their move. On the 14th of June, the Soviets openly called for the Lithuanians to install a Soviet puppet regime, and on the 15th, they invaded. On the same day, the Soviets attacked the Latvian border guards and their families out of nowhere, killing many in extremely brutal ways. The guards' quarters were burned, as well as many people inside of it. 43 civilians turned up to try to save anyone they could from the burning building, but the Soviets simply kidnapped them all and took them across the border. The following day, hell descended on the entire nation of Latvia, and it would change the fate of the nation forever. The introduction to a book which was published when Latvians were allowed to speak freely again following the German occupation, named Latvia, Year of Horror, sums up the feelings of the Latvians at the time. Quote, Suddenly, in the spring of 1940, destruction opened its gates. The Latvian land was awash with poison. It was absorbed into the soil and saturated the air. Bloody vapours darkened the sun, so that a newborn child would absorb it breastfeeding it with his mother's milk. A wife would lose the strength of her hands and her virtue. A man, in his maturity, would dry up and his honour and strength of spirit would become a rotten wood, unable to sprout or even support its own weight. The hand of man wants to erect a monument to an extinguished life, and this life itself leaves footprints among the living. However, those who intend to destroy do so to the very end, so that not even a stone will witness where and how great this destroyed life was. For where the roads of torture are washed with blood and ruins, not even one witness whose blood was spilt remains to testify. Such has been the fate of the Latvian nation." End quote. The author, Pauls Kovaliskis, continues on, quote, These events took place at the very time that the Bolshevik press proclaimed 
The Soviet Union has maintained and continues to maintain a policy that is beneficial and to the highest degree pro-Latvian. The cynicism and bestiality shown by Soviet rule seemed unbelievable. The hypocrisy and falsification of truth were incomprehensible, yet they did happen. The official announcements by the Latvian government protesting the invasion had no effect. Moscow proceeded according to plan for the invasion and the annexation of Latvia. The plans were thorough and far-reaching. On the morning of June 17th, Latvia was overrun by the armed hordes of communist Russia. Many of the invading troops were Asiatic units who could thus not speak to the victims, end quote. They moved deeper into the interior and immediately began a wave of terror, whereupon the old government was booted out and a sham election was set up for a new Soviet government to be established, whereupon a month later the nation was officially annexed into the USSR, an action which had been expressly denied during the election. On the 22nd of July, Carlos Ulmanis, the beloved leader of Latvia, was deported to the Soviet Union, and in 1942, he would die in Turkmenistan of dysentery. During the initial occupation, riots broke out as the Latvian police tried to maintain order, as the bewildered Latvian population watched on as their independence vanished. Kovilskis wrote, quote, But from the underground, sensing ideological allies in the Bolsheviks, there arose the oppressed masses, groups of hooligans, criminals, vagabonds, and many Jews, the chosen people, to welcome the invaders and to attack the police as they tried to maintain order in the streets packed with the invading Soviet soldiers. The Red Army arrived to assure the realization of the USSR and Latvia's mutual assistance pact, and they embraced and protected the pro-communist rioters. Thus, the Soviets demonstrated who deserved their mutual assistance. It was not the Latvian nation at large. Grimly silent, Latvians on the sidewalks were watching a real-life drama, about which no one at the time could sense the horrific outcome of the final act. After the dispersal of the mob, the area of the railroad station and around the police headquarters was littered with rocks hurled by the communist rioters. The Latvian institutions, not yet familiar with the practices of the Bolshevik invaders, attempted to enforce the laws of the land, in the belief that those who had incited the riot should be charged and punished. This was a bitter delusion. The Soviet embassy explained that it was satisfied with the manner in which the Red Army's arrival in Riga had been welcomed. The names of the hooligans charged for rioting indicate their mostly Jewish origin. Kenech Kranes, David Goldberg, Heim Klarkin, Grigory Varuskin, Abrami Genjanov, etc. End quote. The fact that it was Jewish people, vagabonds and others, who didn't really fit into the Christian Latvian system beforehand who welcomed the Soviets with open arms, doesn't really need that much explanation. In the Soviet Union itself, Jewish people were heavily overrepresented in the leadership, one of the reasons being that the Tsar frequently allowed pogroms on their settlements, and the Tsar was essentially in an open war with influential Jews in the US such as Jacob Schiff, who were trying to donate money in any way they could to topple him, including funding the communists or the Japanese during the Russo-Japanese War. Kovaleskis' work was also written during the German occupation, and it's very much a product of its time, but it is important to note who the Latvians blamed for events at the time, as it explains their actions later. Life continued under the harsh Soviet dictatorship for almost an entire year, until things got worse. On the night of the 13th and into the 14th of June 1941, the mass deportations began, which still to this day hurt Latvians to the core. Around 15,000 people were suddenly taken from their homes, including little children, and packed into train cars to be sent east into the Siberian abyss. Over one third of these people would never be seen again. Many Latvians managed to escape arrest, where they joined with others who made plans for a long resistance struggle against the Soviet invaders. They didn't have to wait long. Just over a week after the deportations began, the biggest invasion force in human history came barreling over the Soviet border. It was the Latvian's old enemy, the Germans. This time, however, it would be different. Arthur Silgailis, a Latvian legionnaire, writes in his book, Latvian Legion, about the bitter history between the Latvians and the Germans, and then writes, quote, Relations were so strained that no cultivated propaganda, nor other means, could have changed the Latvian sentiments. However, only one year of Soviet occupation in Latvia was sufficient to drastically change them. At the outbreak of war between Germany and the USSR, when the first German army units crossed the Latvian border, the Germans were greeted wholeheartedly as liberators from the communistic reign of terror, end quote. And so it was. If the Soviet deportations had been planned just a week or so later, Latvian history might have been very different, and thousands of Latvians might have been saved. Regardless, within days, the Germans liberated Leopold from the Soviets after bitter street fighting. 
The Latvian women smothered the Germans in kisses and flowers. Out of nowhere, it appeared they had been saved. The men welcomed the Germans enthusiastically too, but most of all, their thoughts turned to revenge. The Soviets on their way out massacred civilians and set fire to as much of the city as they could. Many that were left behind with no time to escape were those that had welcomed the Soviets a year earlier. Most prominently, the Jews. Most of these Jews would not live to see the end of the war. Within a few weeks, the entirety of Latvia was occupied by the Germans, partly thanks to the efforts of the Latvians who had chosen to resist just over a week earlier. Silgailis wrote, quote, By their actions, the guerrillas created confusion in the rear of the Red Army and indirectly facilitated the advance of the German army. At the same time, they safeguarded the population and its properties from violence, and they also attempted to make contact with the advancing German units in order to coordinate their actions. It must be mentioned that the cooperation of the German army was good. The Wehrmacht permitted the establishment of local Latvian headquarters to be situated beside their own headquarters in the liberated areas for the purpose of performing police duties and to maintain order in the country." End quote. On the 1st of July, the capital of Riga was taken, and the commander of the German units there addressed the population via the radio. At the end of his address, he proudly played the Latvian national anthem, much to the joy of the locals. Before the last Red Army units had even left the city, a man named Dr. Malmanis made a public appeal to his fellow Latvians to register for self-defence service and police duties at his workplace, the Department of Health. In a very short time, 5,000 men had already signed up, these men filtered out around the city to protect important buildings from the fleeing Soviets, among more dangerous tasks such as destroying any last pockets of Soviet resistance in the city. Many Latvians naively thought that they would immediately be made an independent nation as soon as the Germans arrived, and a provisional government was set up. This was quickly rejected however, but the Germans arranged a compromise. A Latvian self-administration was set up, but with no foreign minister or minister of defence. On July 17th, Hitler created the Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories and chose Alfred Rosenberg, a Baltic German from Estonia, to lead it. Rosenberg in turn chose Hinrich Loos, the Gauleiter of Schleswig-Holstein, to run Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Belarus, known collectively as Ostland, for administrative purposes. The policing system in Latvia was refined, and over time the responsibilities of these volunteers grew and grew. The five existing police companies were expanded into a battalion, and another two battalions were created. One of these battalions was to be used outside of Latvia eventually, and they were told that they would be used to quote, fight Bolshevism. The creation of the new battalions was no problem, and due to the sheer number of volunteers, many men had to be rejected. Silgailis describes how these policing duties led to greater trust from the Germans, and their eventual use at the front. Quote, On October 22nd, 1941, the 1st Latvian Battalion left its 4th company, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Carlis Mangulis left Riga by rail, to be used at the discretion of the Wehrmacht, the battalion was enthusiastically seen off by the Latvian population. After its disembarkment at the Sholsti station, the battalion had to secure the railway between the Dino and the Stara Yaya Rusa. Soon thereafter, one company and some platoons of the battalion were attached to the Wehrmacht units in the front lines. Although the Latvians were dispersed in small groups amongst German units, they already showed great gallantry in their first combat engagements, and several of them were decorated for bravery with the German Iron Cross." End quote. The duties behind the lines grew and grew as time progressed, and the partisan war heated up. Gradually, the Germans began to realise that they needed to put more and more trust in the men from the occupied territories to help them out. On the 16th of February, the Germans felt they could trust the Latvians enough to handle recruitment themselves, and the responsibility was duly handed over. And later that year, another big step was taken towards what would become the Latvian Legion. Quote, in June 1942, the 21st Schumer Battalion took up position in the sector from the Ligovsky Canal to Uritsk at the highway Krasnoja Silo, Leningrad. The sector was five kilometers wide and the commander of the battalion was forced to engage all three companies in the front echelon, leaving the battalion without reserves. In these positions, the battalion fought several successful battles. In the middle of July, the Russians tried several times to penetrate into the trenches of the battalion, but were repulsed with losses. On July the 20th, the Russians launched a major attack supported by air, tanks and artillery. This time, they succeeded in penetrating the trenches of the battalion and even encircle its first company. In spite of the inadequate armament which consisted of German, Russian, French, Italian and Czech weaponry and lack of reserves, the battalion not only intercepted the Russian attack but also freed the encircled company. The fighting lasted until July the 28th and this was the first battle in the Second World War, which the Latvians fought as a battalion formation." End quote. Things weren't all rosy, however. 
German liaison officers were attached to these units, which was normal and understandable. What wasn't understandable to the Latvians, however, was the way that these liaison officers would often act as if they were in charge of the unit itself. Quote, Others regarded themselves as supervisors and acted like political commissars in the Red Army. All this created unnecessary embitterment and misunderstandings, end quote. There was also plenty of other incidents which could easily have been avoided, which decreased trust. One Latvian captain, named Captain Puraudins, was court-martialed and sentenced to death for apparently being hostile to Germany. The Latvian self-administration intervened, and he was spared death, but he was demoted to the rank of private. Praudins, proving that he had never been guilty in the first place, ended up surpassing his previous rank, and became a Waffen-Sturmbahnführer. He was also extremely highly decorated by the Germans. Other general issues arose where promises were broken by the Germans, or lower-ranking Germans would try to act as if they were somehow above the Latvians, in flagrant violation of the principles of National Socialism. On one of these occasions, a Latvian named Colonel Kandis publicly slapped a German colonel for insulting Latvian officers. Soon afterwards, Candice died in mysterious circumstances. Many claim it was the Germans, but Candice's adjutant claimed it was a suicide after a big argument. Either way, it left a bitter taste in the Latvian mouths. Things continued on in this same vein, and the Latvians, as well as most of the other ethnic groups in the East, were getting pretty annoyed with the way the Germans were handling things. From the ground up, there simply was no cohesive plan on how to handle the occupied territories. It was as if Hitler was making it up as he went along. Latvians wanted their independence restored and were willing to do anything to help the Germans if it meant attaining that goal. In November 1942, Alfred Waldmanis, the Director General of Justice, submitted a memorandum titled The Latvian Problem to the General Commissioner of Riga. Here, he outlined Latvian problems and wishes. Essentially, the Latvians wanted a semi-restoration of independence, and the example he used was specifically Slovakia. Valmandis followed this up twice, and in the third memorandum, he stated how the Latvians could assist the Germans. He stated that if the Latvians were given some kind of autonomy or independence, then they could easily raise an 100,000 man strong army, which could be used to defend the Latvian territories and lighten the load on the Germans. After all, the Germans desperately needed the manpower, and they were suffering heavy setbacks by this point. At the end of these memorandums, he made sure to specifically state that these were quote, only a suggestion for a base of further discussion. Effectively, the Latvians just wanted some kind of direction or political goal. Some just wanted the ability to help against the common enemy. Eventually, the self-administration of Latvia all co-signed the letter, and it reached the eyes of Gottlob Berger, head of the SS main office, and the father of the foreign SS. Berger said to Himmler that if the Latvians were so keen on taking the fight to the Bolsheviks, then the Latvians should contribute more men to fighting the partisan war, or even as a Latvian legion. Himmler's reaction to this led to the creation of the Latvian Legion. It's a lengthy quote, but Silgailis describes it far better than I can. Quote, Himmler, who was favourably inclined towards the Baltic people, was interested in the proposal. In the second half of January 1943, Himmler visited the 2nd SS Infantry Brigade on the Leningrad Front. The two Latvian police battalions, the 19th and 21st, were at the time attached to the brigade, which was of international, mostly Dutch and Flemish, composition. After the inspection, Himmler decided to raise a Latvian SS Volunteer Legion. On January 23rd, he presented this idea in a report to Hitler. Hitler approved the plan on January 24th, and on the next day, Himmler sent a radio message to the commander of the 2nd SS Infantry Brigade, SS Brigade Führer Gottfried Klingemann. He indicated that the Latvian police battalions had been upgraded to the status of a Latvian legion. According to information received from German sources at that time, Himmler had made this decision of upgrading, as he was impressed by the valour shown by Latvians in previous battles. In December 1942, the valour of Latvians was cited twice in the Daily Front report of the Wehrmacht. The first time was on December 22nd, when the 21st Police Battalion successfully attacked Russian positions that had held out against other units. The second time was some days later when the 21st Police Battalions, in a dashing counter-attack, repulsed the enemy who had penetrated the positions of the adjacent sector, defended by the Dutch units. In the Daily Front report, the Latvians were not called by name, but were mentioned as belonging to the family of German nations." End quote. On top of this, Himmler and Rosenberg were so favourably disposed to the Latvians and the Baltic people in general, that they were willing to actually take things a step further, and grant them near independence, if the Führer would agree of course. Quote, in order to raise the combat spirit of the Latvians, Himmler also decided to grant some independence to the Baltic people. He contacted Alfred Rosenberg, the Reich Minister for the Occupied Eastern Territories, with his proposal. The office of Reich Minister Rosenberg drew up a statute of autonomy for the Free Baltic States, which was endorsed by Himmler, and on February the 8th presented it to Hitler. 
Hitler rejected the plan and on February the 10th signed a brief order authorizing the rising of a Latvian legion, stating that its size and composition would depend upon the number of Latvians available for it, end quote. So in effect, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia actually almost gained some form of independence in early 1943, or at least this was a heavily supported idea by two of the three most important men in the East. Sadly for the Bolts, however, the most important of the three, Adolf Hitler himself, rejected this proposal. The creation of the Legion wasn't completely straightforward. The self-administration demanded a clear political goal that the German authorities in Latvia simply were in no position to give. Most likely in Hitler's mind, giving independence to these people would most likely cause a domino effect, and in general, the Führer was extremely distrustful of people, so to give the Bolts such trust was probably beyond the Führer's capabilities during wartime. After all, he was later proven correct. Finland would surrender and change sides, Romania too, and Hungary would abandon him. Regardless, the Latvians' demands for a political goal fell by the wayside as the Germans began conscripting those in the eastern territories for the labour service as well as the military service, mostly as auxiliaries. In the Germans' minds, these people had been saved from Bolshevism, and in that regard, the population quite agreed. Although, conscripting occupied peoples is actually illegal according to international law. Tens of thousands of Latvians were willing to fight in the Latvian Legion, if given the chance. And now, the Latvians sped up the process. Instead of doing labour duties or police duties, these men wanted to get out there and take it to the Soviets. The new, much lighter demands for the Latvian authorities were as follows. 1. The command of the Legion must be Latvian. 2. Every drafted Latvian of the conscription years 1919 to 1924 would have the right to join the Legion. 3. No pressure would be put on draftees to pick a particular service. 4. The new volunteers were to be trained in Latvia for 6 months, and only then could they be used. 5. The area of engagement was to be the north sector of the Eastern Front. 6. The food, equipment and treatment of the Latvian Legion was to be the same as that of other members of the German Armed Forces. These demands were accepted by the Germans, and in March, the Latvian commanders of the Legion swore their oaths, which went as follows, quote, I swear by God, this holy oath, that in the struggle against Bolshevism, I will give the commander-in-chief of the German armed forces, Adolf Hitler, absolute obedience, and as a brave soldier, I will always be ready to lay down my life for this oath, end quote. A few days later, however, the Germans announced that the appointment of General Bangerskis as the commander of the 1st Latvian Legion was a misunderstanding, and that by law it had to be a German leading it. Obviously, the Latvians didn't take this well, but the Germans were willing to bend the rules a little here. They made a rank called Infantry Führer, which was second in command. The role didn't have very fixed regulations, and it was deliberately set up this way so the Latvians could have more control over the Legion. With time, Bangerskis came to represent not only all Latvian military forces, but all Latvia in general. Regardless of these issues, the Latvian Legion was born. Recruitment began immediately, and as promised, pressure was not put on the Latvians to sign up for the Legion in particular. The units already in existence on the front were slowly reorganised and renamed during 1943, and February the 8th, 1943 is generally regarded as the actual beginning of the Latvian Legion's existence. The first action the Latvians saw since becoming a Legion was right outside of Leningrad. In March 1943, the Russians launched a huge attack in their sector. Despite being pushed back, the Latvians quickly counterattacked, and the front line was restored. For their efforts, 13 legionnaires were awarded the Iron Cross, and after this, they were pulled back from the line for arrest and given their new Waffen SS gear. Breaching earlier promises, and due to some confusion in the German ranks, a thousand untrained Latvians were sent to reinforce their countrymen near the front in a swampy area so inhospitable that it was nicknamed the end of the world. Despite all odds, these basically untrained men were able to build up an adequate defence and make quite a reputation for the Latvians. The summer remained rather quiet. However, in early September, this all changed, as the Russians threw everything they had at a defensive position at Spaskaya Polist, south of Leningrad. The position was held by Germans and Latvians, and over a period of a week, there was a total of 18 attacks and counterattacks. On the 9th of September, the Russians were defeated, and the Latvians took control of the hill. Despite the victory, the Latvians took unsustainable losses. 145 men were killed, and 650 were wounded. On a positive note, 113 legionnaires were awarded the Iron Cross, and 9 were awarded the Iron Cross First Class. Most importantly, however, the reputation of the Latvians grew once more. <laughs> 
For the remainder of the year, the Russians dared not try again in the north. Early the following year, however, they tried their luck, and by March, the siege of Leningrad had been lifted. The Leningrad-Novgorod offensive had been a resounding success. The Germans and their allies simply could not hold on any longer. For the Latvians, it was an exhausting time. There was bright spots where they would hold a position courageously and inflict ridiculous losses on the Russians, but due to other areas of the front being taken, they would have to withdraw. For weeks and weeks, this state of affairs continued with constant battles followed by constant retreats. To add to the misery was the seemingly endless partisan attacks in the rear, as well as the crippling frostbite, which sent many of the men to an early grave. The field hospitals simply could not handle the mounting casualties. On the 26th of February, the Latvians passed through the Ostwall, also known as the Panther Line, a long defensive line set up across the entire front. They could finally get some actual rest. Quote, With the crossing of the Panther Line, a period of great personal suffering and heroic sacrifices ended for the brigade, none of which passed unnoticed. It was mentioned in the Daily Front report of February the 29th, 1944. In heavy retreat, battles in the north sector of the Eastern Front, the 2nd Latvian SS Volunteer Brigade, under the command of SS Oberführer Schult, decorated with oak leaves to the Knight's Cross, and its Latvian infantry leader, Standartenführer Weiss, decorated with the Knight's Cross, has shown a special valour." The 2nd Latvian Brigade then headed to Ostrov, just south of Saikov, and manned the Ostwall positions along the Velikaya River. Adjacent to them was their sister formation, the 15th Latvian Division. When the positions were secure, both formations were subordinated to the 6th SS Corps. Up until now, the 15th Latvian Division had had a rough time of it. Even forming the division had been a nightmare due to German meddling, which annoyed both Latvians and Germans involved in the division alike. At one point, some other Germans were so jealous of the unit's more recent weapons, such as the MG42s, that they literally stole them from the Latvians. Despite these hiccups, they did see combat in early 1944, slightly further to the south, where the retreat was happening, much as it was all around Leningrad. They fought bravely, but no single division could hold the Soviet tide, no matter how many casualties they dished out to the Soviets. At times, they encircled and decimated entire Soviet units, leaving thousands dead. But even still, it was not enough. By the time they reached their defensive positions on the river, they had suffered absolutely gruelling casualties. The Ostwall wasn't all it was cracked up to be, however, and it was horribly underprepared. To make matters worse, in the area the Latvians were meant to defend, the east bank of the river was actually far higher up than the west bank, resulting in the Russians being able to dominate them from above. To get round this, they crossed the river and set up new positions on the east bank, a very dangerous task. For 10 days from the 1st of March 1944, the Russians came at the Latvians on the east bank again and again and again. Maintaining the usual pattern, the Russians took ridiculous, almost unbelievable losses, but the numerically inferior Latvians were simply unable to keep this game up, and by the 10th, many of the Latvians had to pull back to the west bank with heavy losses. On the 16th of March, the Russians launched their biggest assault of the battle so far, and took Hill 93.4, which dominated the east bank. In this task, the Russians were victorious, but over the coming days the Latvians geared up to take it back, and duly did so with very few casualties. Afterwards it was revealed that this fighting had been 11 Russian divisions against two Latvians. Although German divisions tended to be bigger than their Soviet counterparts, this was still quite the ratio. Apart from the success of the battle against all odds, it is extremely memorable for Latvians for another reason. The 16th of March marked the only time in the Second World War that the two Latvian divisions fought together under a common Latvian command. Forevermore, this will be known as Latvian Legion Day, and even now, there is a regular, heavily attended parade for the Latvian Legion held in Riga on the 16th of March. They weren't out of it yet, however. Silgailis recalls, quote, The battles on the east bank of the river demanded great efforts, as well as hardship from the defenders. In some areas where the ground was swampy, it was impossible to dig in, Therefore, trenches had to be built from snow above ground level. There were no bunkers or other kinds of cover where the men could find shelter from the cold or from enemy shelling, and for a long time they were content with provisional tents built from branches and snow. Campfires could not be maintained during daytime. The smoke from them immediately provoked the Russians into shelling, usually with mortar launchers. Consequently, it was only feasible to have campfires at night when smoke was not visible. As it turned out, however, the men were unable to even have this convenience, as their manpower had decreased to such an extent that everyone available was forced to man the trenches at night on the front line. The positions on the east bank of the river were of very shallow depth, and because of this, all trains were sent to the west bank. As the enemy kept the river valley under observation during the daytime, the supply of food and ammunition, as well as the evacuation of wounded, could only be carried out at night, 
The wounded, at times, had to wait up to 24 hours in the cold for evacuation, and food, when it reached the men at the front line, was usually frozen. In spite of all these unfavourable circumstances, the spirit of the men was unbroken, and being fully aware that by defending their positions, they were preventing a repeat occupation of their homeland by the communists. They had two desires, to have at least one night's peaceful sleep in a heated room, and a bath to rid themselves of lice. In spite of all these hardships, both Latvian formations were able to recover substantially and replenish their losses." End quote. After a very brief period of peace, the Russians tried their hand again on the 26th of March, and this time, the already shattered divisions simply could not hold. By day's end, there was a 3 km deep and 4 km wide bridgehead across the Velikaya River. All efforts to enlarge this bridgehead the next day failed, but regardless, the Russians had crossed. The Germans and Latvians tried all they could to counterattack and send the Russians back across. The Germans tried everything from Stukas to heavy tanks, and every time, they were repelled with losses. By this point, one of the Latvian divisions had become so depleted that they had to be rotated out and taken to a quieter part of the line. Even on their way out, however, they repelled enemy counterattacks and even decimated a new enemy bridgehead. The fighting managed to increase in its intensity, and the Russians seemed desperate for victory. Most engagements tended to go along the lines of this one, quote, During the day's combat, the enemy sustained heavy losses, while only gaining a breakthrough 600 meters deep and about 400 meters in width. Their losses were 400 killed and 14 tanks destroyed. The 42nd Grenadier Regiment lost 39 dead and 89 wounded." End quote. Attack after attack came, but none were successful enough to make the difference, and eventually the Soviets just gave up. They held their little bridgeheads, which they couldn't escape from, and dug in. The Latvians had held the river against all odds, and the road to the Baltics was saved, at least for now. By the end of April, all the Latvian units had been removed piece by piece following the heavy fighting, and eventually they were all grouped up near Bardova to defend a 46 km stretch of land, 20 km of which was lakes. Here, the men were able to relax, receive reinforcements, and undergo much-needed training courses which would prepare them for the year to come. One issue hindering this task was the typical Russian muddy season of the spring, but as the dry season came in, the units were able to completely restore their effectiveness. In June, the Russians tried their luck in this area, but much like before, they were successful in crossing the river, but simply couldn't take advantage and expand the bridgehead. Soviet penal battalions, which were promised forgiveness for their crimes, were among the most effective in this fighting, but due to the nature of these units, many deserted and simply told the Latvians and their German allies where the attacks would be coming from, and they were able to prepare themselves enough to repel them. Meanwhile, elsewhere, things weren't quite so stable. Operation Bagration began on the 22nd of June, and a breakthrough occurred in Vitebsk in Belarus, to the south of the Latvians. It quickly became obvious that despite how well it had held, Army Group North would have to fall back. This action was planned for July the 10th. That same day, however, on the 10th, the Soviets launched a huge artillery bombardment, which prevented the troops up north from actually being able to withdraw, and then, as usual, massed infantry attacks followed. The fact that the withdrawal was planned for the same day was a plague on the morale of the men, and the retreat took place in complete disorder. After the initial shock, things calmed down a little bit, and occasional defensive positions were set up to help other units retreat. During all of this, the charging Russians were annihilated time and time again by the Latvians, allowing time for the others to not get encircled. All throughout July, an endless retreat ensued towards the Latvian border, in which the Latvians were mentioned many times in the Daily Front report for their bravery or for their assistance in helping the Germans retreat in an orderly fashion as Soviet tanks pursued them. With the deterioration of the situation in the south, however, they had to speed things up, at the risk of Latvia and Estonia being completely encircled. On the 18th of July, the Latvians crossed into Latvian territory near Kosava. Their Russian adventure was over, and they were now fighting for the defence of their homeland and their families. By this time, the Latvians had once again been brutalised by weeks of endless fighting, and another period of reorganisation and reinforcement was needed. They continued west towards Murana, deeper in the interior, where the 15th Latvian Division turned over most of its men and equipment to the 19th Latvian Division. The remnants of the 15th continued further west until August, when they were taken to West Prussia, where we'll pick up with them later. Meanwhile, the 19th Division set up defensive positions around Lubans Lake. Meanwhile, the Soviets had rolled through Lithuania rather easily, and had now actually split Latvia in two, as well as encircling most of Army Group North. 
Just weeks later, however, a counter-attack was staged and the encirclement was lifted. As for the Latvians, a series of battles occurred south of Lubans Lake, but the Soviets were repelled with extremely heavy losses. In the north, they tried again, but once more, they failed to penetrate the Latvian positions. On the left flank of the Latvians, though, the Soviets succeeded in breaking through the German units there. The Latvians counterattacked and reclaimed the area, but there was simply too much land to cover at this point, and not enough men. They continued to hold central Latvia, but the situation was quickly growing perilous. The north of the lake was under heavy attack, and the Germans tried to assist, but even their intervening couldn't prevent the reality of what would soon happen if these positions were held. By August the 5th, the men had reached the Ivikste River, a little to the west, where a new front line was established. This series of events continued with the Russians throwing themselves headfirst into attacks where they would be massacred by the Latvians, only for the Germans and Latvians to have to pull back because they couldn't hold this many attacks of such a heavy magnitude at once. Meanwhile, as the men were pushed ever westwards, they helped refugees as much as they could on their path to the west. All over the east of Latvia, the Soviets unleashed a wave of brutality upon the locals. Many of the crimes I've read over the years are simply unspeakable and they couldn't be included in the video. But one of the most common stories is that of crimes against children, especially babies. Often to get information from the local women, they would be restrained whilst boiling hot water was poured on their children. The women would obviously have no idea about military matters, and thus the torture would continue. Many simply went insane. Another common story regarding children is that of Soviet soldiers simply picking up small children in front of their parents, usually just the mother, and smashing the child against the wall, killing it. Understandably, no one wanted this fate for themselves, and tens of thousands that could still escape did just that, and headed west towards the ports of Riga, Ventspils, and Liepaja, where German transport ships were more than happy to accommodate them on their flight to Germany. Checkpoints would be set up along the paths for these people by the German authorities so they could be fed and supplied with clean water among other supplies. By war's end, there would be over 100,000 bolts in German or Central European refugee camps. Most would never return. The Latvians and Germans continued to do their duty and delayed the Soviet advance. Further north, the Battle of Narva Bridgehead, also known as the Battle of the European SS, was coming to a close, where Germans, along with Norwegian, Danish, Dutch, Walloon, Flemish and Estonians, were holding against massively numerically superior enemy forces. In the end, they were forced to withdraw, but the casualties they inflicted brought invaluable time for the rest of Army Group North, and essentially made the Soviets unable to push the men into the sea as they had hoped. Even still, their retreat was only small, and then the Battle of the Tannenberg Line commenced, which again resulted in the annihilation of the Soviet attackers. The North held. Below Lake Pipus, the Soviets did break through, but they were eventually ground to a halt. Thanks to the Germans and Latvians in Latvia, and the European army up north, almost all of the units of Army Group North were able to retreat in good order to Riga and beyond. During a lull before the withdrawal, the Latvians made an appeal to the nation. Quote, during the Luban battles, infantry leader Loeb made an ardent appeal to the Latvians to join the Legion for the defence of their homeland. There was a great response to his appeal. Thousands of locals heeded the call and signed up. Many of their families joined the retreat to the west too, as they were well aware what would happen to them if it was discovered their family was in the Legion. By mid-September, the Latvians were near Sasis, outside of Riga, fighting constant skirmishes as they went, but always maintaining a controlled retreat. All over Estonia and Latvia, it was similar, as everyone retreated in an orderly fashion, keeping the attackers at bay. By early October, most units had already crossed the Dorg of a river, and the Latvians soon joined them, where they were ordered to Jukste, to the west of Riga. On the 16th of October, the last German units to leave Riga blew up the two main bridges across the Dorgova, and the Soviets proclaimed the recapture of the Latvian capital. Vidzeme had fallen, and now it was time for a new battle. The defence of Kerzeme had begun, better known to history as Courland. After successfully evacuating most of Army Group North and crossing the Dorgova, a new defensive line was set up, stretching from below Leopai in the south to Klapgalas in the north. The Latvians themselves initially set up on the railway line between Zelgava and Leopai in an area 10 kilometers wide. All wasn't well, however. As the name suggests, Army Group North was now in a pocket. They had escaped from the bigger one, and now they were in a much more manageable, defensible one, but it was a pocket nonetheless. The men couldn't be used in the defence of more important areas, to the Germans at least, like Berlin. Guderian suggested that Korzeme should be abandoned, but Hitler was having none of it. He stated that to abandon Korzeme would result in the obliteration of the morale of the Baltic SS men, and that the area could be used for offensive operations, and so it was, the men would have to hold. 
Fully evacuating may have been an extremely hard endeavour at this point anyway, but regardless, Hitler's decision ended up saving the lives of thousands upon thousands of innocent Latvians via the ships full of refugees that returned to Germany each time supplies were dropped off in Leopaya and Ventspils. The first Battle of Courland took place in mid to late October 1944, and quite simply, it just resulted in a bloodbath for the Soviets. They desperately tried to finish the Germans and their Latvian allies off, but they could barely make headway anywhere. The defenders remained calm, and whenever there was a breakthrough, they would calmly deal with it, obliterate the tanks that had pushed through, and just reinstate the front line. On the 22nd of October, the Russians just could not sustain such losses, and they called off the attack. The First Battle of Courland was a roaring success for the Germans. The Russians, for their part, had traded thousands of lives for a 2 km deep and 10 km wide strip of land. Four Soviet infantry divisions and two armoured brigades had been annihilated beyond repair in the attempt. The Soviets weren't done, however, and they tried their luck again in the Second Battle of Courland. This lasted from the 27th of October until the 25th of November. This time the fighting was not in the area the Latvians were stationed in, but there was 70 Russian infantry divisions and several armoured formations against a handful of heavily depleted German units. The result was once again the same. The endless waves of Soviets threw themselves forwards again and again and again and again, only to barely inflict any losses on the Germans. Once more, the Soviets were brutalised and they gave up. In early November, there was a separate, small-scale action where the Latvians were set up. Here, they once more repulsed the Russians, but in the process, actually made some new friends. The Russians had begun conscripting Latvians from the eastern half of Latvia, and as a form of collective punishment, they were essentially sent forwards into the fray as cannon fodder. If they didn't push forward, they would be killed by the Soviet commissars. Obviously, the vast majority of these men would just desert at the earliest opportunity, and they duly did so when the Russian attack failed. The legionnaires had no trouble at all making these men see the Latvian legion as a better cause to fight for. In the legion's own ranks, things weren't so great however. The war appeared lost and there was rumours that the Germans would abandon Latvia, or send the Latvian 19th Division to Germany, as had happened to the 15th. As a result, there was increased desertion. Some fled to the forests and prepared to fight a guerrilla war against the Soviets, and some of these groups had ties to British or American intelligence, and essentially had insane hopes that somehow the Brits, Americans, and neutral Sweden would diplomatically restore Latvian independence after the war. Others felt the deserting now would get them and their families better treatment from the communists. Again, this was naive. Silgailis wrote of the crisis, quote, Fortunately, the crisis did not last long. After the front line in Kordazimir was stabilised, and the commander of Army Group North, Colonel General Schoener, made it known at a meeting of unit commanders of the 19th Latvian Division, the Kordazimir would be defended by all available means. The crisis suddenly evaporated. Many deserters returned, and in addition, several volunteers joined the Legion. The great number of refugees in Kordazimir regarded the armed struggle as the only way to save themselves from the return of communistic terror." End quote. In the latter half of November, the lull in the fighting was used to build up the defences and combat training of the troops. Minefields were set up and wire entanglements were set up in front of the front line. There was trenches and bunkers everywhere and the entire Korsame area was essentially being turned into a fortress. There were so many defences in fact that there were soon five entire defensive lines set up. If the Russians had not succeeded before, they certainly weren't going to now. As the men were preparing for Christmas on the 23rd, the Russian attack suddenly came in the Latvian sector. The artillery was so fierce that the Latvians simply could not respond. To add insult to injury, there was often as many as 500 aircraft in the air at times. What happened next seemed to spell the end for a moment, quote, The shelling lasted two hours and was followed by an assault stretching nine kilometres wide between Rudini and Sudmali. The assault, supported by an armoured corps, smashed into the left wing of the 19th Latvian Division and with its centre into the 21st Air Force Field Division. By noon, the enemy tanks had penetrated well into the German division's positions, and its infantry had reached the line of Prizusags, Urumbinas, Kurimunas, Pinava, Irbas. The situation became extremely critical due to lack of reserves. The enemy had opened the road to the city of Ventspils on the east coast of the Baltic Sea, but then the advancing Russian tanks unexpectedly met strong resistance from the 2nd, 3rd, and 19th Artillery Regiment, which destroyed 14 tanks by direct firing in a short time and forced the others to retreat. A few of the enemy tanks which had succeeded in slipping through were stopped in the rear by the 19th Pioneer Battalion and some German units." End quote. 
The next day was just as brutal, and the Russians threw tank after tank into the fray to capitalise on any breakthroughs. Ultimately though, as the defending Latvians and their German allies regained their composure, the front was stabilised. Many encircled Latvian units held out and sent dozens of tanks to a fiery doom until they were eventually freed. By the 25th, the Russians were running out of steam, and it appeared there would be no success for them that Christmas. They had traded over a hundred tanks for a tiny area of land which didn't really change their situation, but regardless, they didn't let up. Until the 29th, this state of affairs continued of assault after assault, where the Russians would be unsuccessful on most of the front and make small gains in other areas. On that day, two Russian messengers deserted to the Latvians and told them of the Soviets' next move. A trap was laid out, and the next day, their information proved correct. The Soviets came barreling into the towns of Vangani and Pumpuri, only to get absolutely decimated by artillery fire and pushed back out again with a pre-prepared counter-attack. During this move, more Russians were captured, and they told the Latvians that they had been taking extremely heavy and unsustainable casualties. On the 31st, the Russians tried once more, but failed, and this was the last of it. The Third Battle of Courland had been a roaring success for the Latvians. Thousands upon thousands of Soviets had perished, and hundreds of tanks had been turned to scrap. Kurzeme lived on another day. Silgailis sums up the situation, quote, During the nine days of combat, 46 Russian infantry and several armoured divisions had suffered complete destruction, all for the price of capturing some tens of square kilometres of terrain. The 19th Latvian division alone had knocked out 10 special trained infantry divisions and one armoured corps. Among the prisoners, and dead, were Latvians from Vidzeme, who the Russians had hurriedly conscripted after the German retreat to Kurzeme. The fact was confirmed by prisoners that the Russian forces in the area of Dobele, Jukste were exhausted from the recent battles and not suitable for actions in the near future." End quote. A small-scale counterattack was attempted by the Latvians to improve the front line, but after a few days it became evident that this was a pointless endeavour and they left it alone before they began taking heavy losses. On January the 12th, the Russians launched their last major offensive on the Eastern Front. They crossed the Vistula River and from there they drove into the heart of Germany. Kordozeme fell right down the priority list for both sides, and seven divisions from the pocket were quickly sent to Germany to deal with the offensive. As a result, the remaining units had to extend their responsibilities. The Latvians especially, as the strongest division there manpower-wise, had to dramatically take on more tasks. Despite the odds being stacked even more in the Soviets' favour, they still couldn't break through. The fourth Battle of Courland took place from the 23rd of January to the 3rd of February. The attack took place in various areas of the front, but the main goal was to take the main port of Leopaya in the south. This failed miserably, and the flow of refugees could continue to evacuate using the port. The Latvians were then given nine days to get some hard-earned rest before the Russians tried once more. Despite their gains in Germany, and the inevitability of their victory there, they still continued to try to take Korzeme. On the 12th of February, the 5th Battle of Kolum began. The important town of Jukste was taken by the Soviets with heavy losses on the first day, and then things petered out. On the 17th, a new assault was attempted by the Russians, and this ended in an absolute fiasco, as the Germans encircled four of the 11 infantry divisions and annihilated them, down to a man. Further south, endless attempts were made to capture Leopaya, but again, this just resulted in the now age-old tale of thousands of dead Soviet troops. By the 14th of March, they gave up. The 5th Battle of Courland resulted in extremely minor gains once more. On the 16th of March, Army Group North, now called Army Group Courland, sent a report back to HQ, stating their estimated Russian losses so far. It read, 320,000 wounded, dead and prisoners, 2,388 tanks, 695 aircraft, 906 guns and 1,140 machine guns lost. Whilst the Soviets had this seemingly endless supply of tanks and aircraft to use, the Germans and the Latvians didn't even really have enough resources to even transport their men around. A lot of the men were taken about with the help of Latvian farmers and their horse-pulled wagons. Almost immediately after this, the 6th Battle of Kolum began and was over by the 4th of April. There was some success, but again the losses were heavily disproportionate and a careful retreat was staged to shorten the front line. Things remained this way until the end of the war, and I'll let Silgailis finish the story of Korzeme. Quote, Germany capitulated on May the 5th, 1945. The commander of the 19th Latvian Division, SS Gruppenführer Streckenbach, communicated the capitulation order by phone on May the 8th at 2pm to all unit commanders. At this time, the so-called Fortress Courland ceased to exist. The Latvians' last hope of seeing their beloved homeland free of communism disappeared. What the Russians were unable to gain on the battlefield, they took when the defenders were forced to comply with the capitulation order and to lay down their arms. 
Many legionnaires did not surrender, but continued to fight the communists as guerrillas. It is impossible, due to lack of official reports, to tally the exact number of Latvian soldiers who were still in Kozume when Germany capitulated. The estimations were 19th Latvian Division, about 5,200 men. Battle group Rusmanis in the area of Dundaga, about 2,500 men. Seven construction battalions, about 2,800 men. Three police battalions, about 1,100 men. Air Force helpers, about 560 men. Other units, about 1,000 men. This was an approximate total of nearly 14,000 men. The eight Latvians to whom the Knight's Cross had been awarded during the defence of Kurizume were proof of the devotion and heroism with which the Latvians fought to preserve the freedom of Latvia. The commander of the 6th SS Corps, SS Obergruppenführer Kruger, and a group of German officers attempted to escape to East Prussia. The group was captured by Russians, and Kruger committed suicide. The commander of the 19th Latvian Division, SS Gruppenführer Streckenbach, was taken prisoner. He spent nine years in isolation at the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, and three and a half years in the Vojkova labor camp. He was released on October the 10th, 1955, and returned to Germany." End quote. As noted earlier, the two divisions were separated once they crossed into the Latvian border in August 1944. The 15th Division headed to an SS training camp in West Prussia, where they were to spend the next few months preparing for the final defence of Germany. Training was hard, and the accommodations weren't fit for an entire division, so many men had to make do in barns. Equipment was also lacking, and things such as anti-tank guns were now replaced with Panzerfausts and Panzerschrecks. It wasn't until January 1945 that the Latvians were pulled into the fray again, and even still, they weren't really at combat readiness. But was anyone at this point? The Hitler Youth and the Volkssturm were hardly combat ready troops, but they were ready to make the sacrifice anyway, and the Latvians were of much the same opinion. On the 21st, they set off to defend the Vistula Oder Canal against the Russians, who had launched an offensive in the area on the 12th of January. On the 23rd, they attacked to recapture the town of Immenheim from the Russians, which they quickly did without issue. Here, the detachment took 30 prisoners, as well as trucks and other important equipment. Most importantly of all, they managed to free a thousand men of the Latvian field replacement depot, which had been captured. Undoubtedly, many of these men would have perished in the Siberian wilderness if not for the intervention of their countrymen. For the rest of the month, the various Latvian battalions continued to arrive to help their comrades, as well as their French SS allies who were fighting alongside them. Together, they were able to halt the Soviet tide for a while, but as with all things on the Eastern Front in 1945, Soviet victory was inevitable. Certain areas would hold completely, others would hold for a long time and inflict heavy casualties on the Soviets, but eventually they would be forced to retreat, which would necessitate the other units withdrawal too, to maintain a stable front line. This state of affairs continued further and further to the west. In order to prevent a total encirclement, all the divisions in the area had to pull out quickly, and it was during this mess that the division took the heaviest casualties. Refugees, and German, French, and Latvian units, among others, flooded west, and the Red Air Force opened up on men and refugees alike indiscriminately. The artillery was pouring down on them from all sides too, and by the time the Latvians had got out of the area, and into the new, quieter area they were sent to, they had taken a serious beating. In early February, the Russians attacked the new Latvian position at Karmin, in Pomerania. The situation here became critical, as the units around them folded, and the town itself was on the verge of encirclement. Permission to leave, or by this point, break out, were not given, and the Latvians had to defend the town as best as they could, whilst the world around them seemed to collapse. By the 13th, the situation was untenable, and the town was essentially either rubble or on fire. The Latvians decided to defy orders and break out of the suicidal mission. On the 23rd of February, the Russians launched their offensive in Pomerania to cut off the Germans and their allies in the eastern half of it, resulting in a scramble for the coasts of refugees and units alike. The Latvian training camp in West Prussia was also cut off from the Latvians in the west. The endless retreat all around the area continued into early March. Town after town was held, but eventually overrun. And these few weeks were essentially the same thing, over and over again, day after day. The Latvians and the SS Charlemagne were essentially joined at the hip at this time, as both units were extremely depleted, with no means of getting reinforcements due to their nations now being occupied. Together, they moved ever westwards, doing their best with next to no communications and very limited supplies. Silagailis describes the men's condition, quote, The physical condition of the division at the time was extremely poor. The continual marches and battles had left the men close to complete exhaustion. 
The lack of food was of grave concern, as for several weeks there had been no regular supply, and the men had been forced to forage at deserted farms. Respectfully, the food shortage peaked, as no food could be found at all. This supply had been depleted by previous troops and refugees. Food supplies dropped by aircraft were minimal." End quote. He continues on, which sums up the fighting at the time. Quote, the 15th Latvian Division began to move again on the evening of March the 10th in a westerly direction along the coast of the Baltic Sea. The 33rd Grenadier Regiment, having reached Lensin, was assigned to Corps Group Munsell. On its way, the division encountered enemy resistance at Hof. The only combat unit the divisional command had at its disposal at the time was the artillery battalion. The artillerymen daringly attacked and routed the enemy, inflicting substantial losses. This enabled the division and other German units, as well as thousands of refugees, to continue their march. To secure the continued retreat of the division, the artillerymen took up positions at the edge of the woods in the vicinity of Pustau. Here, the brave artillerymen, whose combat strength had shrunk to 70 men, repulsed several Russian attacks. The artillerymen, after running out of ammunition, were relieved by a German unit just before midnight on March the 11th. They retreated to Berg Dievesnau, where they arrived at noon on March the 12th. The only gun they had left was the one they had salvaged in the Ostenhide Forest." End quote. So essentially, the entire front was on the verge of collapse if it hadn't already at this point. The men were fighting as if already dead, with no regard for their lives, as all that mattered to the Germans and Latvians alike was ensuring the safety of the refugees. After all, among the millions heading west, tens of thousands of them were Latvian. The Germans were holding the Russians back in Korzeme, allowing the escape of Latvian refugees after all too. Everyone was in this together. By the 12th of March, the flood of refugees calmed considerably, and the worst of the Battle of Pomerania seemed to be over. For the men's efforts, SS Standartenführer Jarnums was awarded the German Cross in gold for his outstanding leadership during the past few weeks. After this, the Germans requested many of the Latvian weapons which they had just spent weeks retreating with to be handed over. The Latvians were rather annoyed, given they had just exhausted themselves carrying them all this time, but the reality was that the division was in no fit condition to continue the fight, and these other units would make far better use of them. After the Pomeranian battles, it was more a matter of the Latvians saving themselves. They could scarcely help in the fight itself, and if they were captured by the Soviets, the only thing that awaited them was death, or decades in a gulag. Standard and Furajanums sent a patrol to make arrangements with the advancing Americans, and the Americans were happy to play ball. After all, these men weren't viewed quite the same way as perhaps SS units of other nations, and the Allies had been pretty horrified by Stalin's treatment of the Baltic states before Churchill jumped into bed with him. Silgailis describes the division's end. The driver of the delegation returned home at 9.45pm with the message that the surrender was to take place no later than 1am on April the 25th. Ten minutes later, Standard and Fjordjarnums addressed his men with a brief farewell speech and the regiment in close column began to move. At 1am, they were met by two American officers. The regiment ceased to exist at that moment. A difficult period of captivity was in store for these men. At the time of surrender, the regimental strength was 40 officers, 126 NCOs, and 658 men. Within the next few days, after the departure of Battle Group Jarnums, the situation of the remaining divisional units in the area of Neustrelitz became more critical due to the advancing Red Army. On April the 28th, the division was ordered to move to the Malshina Lake, where it was to take up defensive positions. Fearing they would be cut off by the advancing Russian armoured units, divisional units began arbitrarily retreating to the west. On the night of May the 1st, about 4,000 men had already assembled in the forest of Schwinz. The division at the time was assigned to the 3rd Panzer Corps. The commander of the corps, Lieutenant General Dornick, visited the headquarters of the division at Roost on the night of May 1st, 2nd, and ordered the division to man defensive positions on the Goldberg, Dolbertin, Nienhagen line. This was the last German attempt to engage Latvians in combat. The divisional units at that time were moving west, and the commander of the 15th Supply Regiment let it be known to the commander of the division, SS Oberführer Burke, that it was an unrevocable decision by the Latvians not to fight again. Burke agreed to disregard the order given by Lieutenant General Dornick, saying, As everything is lost, I, as an honest soldier, cannot allow the Latvians to perish in the area of Goldberg Nienhagen. Continue on the road you chose. End quote. On the morning of the 2nd of May, other Latvian units of the division handed themselves over to the Western Allies. Meanwhile, over the past few days, other Latvians, who were simply unable to carry on fighting due to lack of equipment, headed west to surrender with hundreds of thousands of other Germans. 
The 15th Fusilier Battalion lost contact with the rest of the division and ended up drifting towards Berlin, where they became involved in the defence of the city. Together with their mostly French and Scandinavian colleagues, they held on right to the last, fighting from house to house as the circle closed around Hitler's bunker, the bunker that was meant for Himmler, and the Reichstag. The losses here were absurd, much as they were with every other unit, but all of them knew what they had signed up for, and right to the last, they inflicted far heavier casualties on the Soviets. It was only on the 2nd of May, when they were ordered to defend the aviation ministry, that they arrived and realised that the German units there had already gone, and that now, with only a handful of men left, there was no use fighting. The Germans had already come to this decision earlier in the day, and the evening before. Berlin surrendered that same day. As for the men at the training camp who had just been cut off in West Prussia, they had to join the general retreat to the port cities. 176 of these men, who were now unarmed, discovered free Latvian tugboats, and the captains were happy enough to take the Latvians to neutral Sweden. When they arrived, they were interned by the Swedish government. In 1946, when the USSR demanded that they be turned over, the Swedes capitulated. Many of these men would never be seen again, and others were lost in the gulag system or executed. Other men from the training camp managed to make it to northern Germany, which was still unoccupied at this time, and later on they were able to surrender to the Western Allies. Many, if not the majority however, were simply unable to escape in time, and they were swallowed up by the Red Army, and they too became prisoners, or were killed in cold blood. In this story, there has been a lot left out due to the sheer scale of Latvian participation in the German war effort. One key example is the Latvian air squadrons. Of these, there was two. First squadron completed 2,900 flights, and the second completed nearly 2,500 flights. Around 80% of the flying personnel were awarded the Iron Cross first or second class. Unfortunately, by late 1944 however, they were simply unable to supply these air wings, and they were slowly disbanded. The Estonian air formations were also disbanded. Both nations' airmen were taken to Germany to be integrated into new units. Their continued usefulness was shattered when they were taken to Germany and assigned to Lieutenant Colonel Fix, a German paratrooper. Silgailis writes of their bitter commander, quote, Lieutenant Colonel Fix was by nature robust and ill-tempered. He had participated as a volunteer in the infamous army of Bernant Avalov during the post-war years of World War I. They had been decisively defeated by the Latvians during the Independence War of Latvia in 1918-1920, and therefore was hostile towards Baltic people. He didn't conceal his hatred. When he was ordered to promote an Estonian officer aspirant to the rank of second lieutenant, he openly criticised the order by saying, If I have to promote an Estonian to the rank of second lieutenant, then I should promote my sergeants to the rank of captain. Initially, Lieutenant Colonel Fix announced that his task was to organise a Baltic legion of paratroop units. However, some days later it became known that the Estonians and Latvians were to be trained as infantry units of the paratroopers. The training itself was carried out in a humiliating manner. Officers and NCOs were separated from their men. The men were trained by German NCOs as if they were new recruits. In mid-November, the officers were sent to Esbjerg for a special infantry training course. There, they were taught target practice as if they were beginners, and also instructed in the rudimentary parts of the machine gun. The course was headed by a German sergeant major. Lieutenant Colonel Fix rejected all contact with the Inspector General of the Latvian Legion. Near the end of November, at an officers' meeting, Fix queried the Estonian and Latvian officers as to whether they'd be willing to fight on the Western Front. The proposal was strongly rejected." End quote. Apart from the airmen, there were other Latvians in police battalions, coast guard units, and anti-air units. The anti-air units participated in all of the events during the retreat through Latvia, and spared a lot of Latvian cities the fate of some of the German cities. There were also Air Force helpers, Boys born in the years 1927 were conscripted for this position, and boys born in 1928 were allowed to volunteer if they so wished. Their recruitment was overseen by the Latvian Youth Organization, and they were made to sign a service obligation which was worded, quote, I promise as an Air Force helper in the struggle against Bolshevism, under all circumstances, to do my duty faithfully, obediently, and bravely, and commit all my vigour, as is suitable to a Latvian boy, end quote. At war's end, 2,500 of these young Air Force helpers were in Germany. Many were in Berlin, where they probably met plenty of boys their age fighting in the Hitler Youth. The vast majority of the boys in Germany managed to surrender to the Western Allies, but the ones in Kurzeme still weren't so lucky, and these 500 fell into the hands of the Soviets. It is also worth mentioning the Inspector General of the Latvian Legion, General Bangerskis, who didn't really fit into the main narrative of this video. When the Legion was founded, he was given this unique role, and was given the following fairly vague functions, but this was done on purpose to allow him more leeway. Quote, Ideological leadership in the struggle against Bolshevism, 
representation of Latvian interest in the Wehrmacht and SS command, supervision of cultural and medical welfare, as well as other welfare provided by the Latvian people on a voluntary basis, translation of instructions, regulations, orders, etc. into Latvian, end quote. Silgailis goes on to explain Bangeskis' role further. Quote, in November 1943, the Inspector General was also commissioned by the Latvian self-administration with the conscription of Latvian citizens for military service. In the course of events, after the Latvian self-administration left Latvia prior to the fall of the capital Riga, the Inspector General saw himself obliged, beside his military duties, also to assume the caretaking, not only of the civil population in parts of Latvia still unoccupied by the Bolshevists, but also of Latvians who had taken refuge or had been forcibly moved to Germany, end quote. In this role, Bangerskis would report directly to Reichsfuhrer SS Himmler, and overall, things went pretty well in terms of Latvian-German relations, except the odd bad actor like Lieutenant Colonel Fix and his parachute training. It is also worth noting that there was a very small handful of Latvians who, despite the Soviet occupation, still held the ancient anti-German grudge that most Latvians once had, but these men were mostly ridiculed by their fellow countrymen for living in the past. Even after the war, he continued to care for the exiled Latvians, and Silgailis constantly speaks of him in the highest possible manner in his book on the Legion. Quote, Bangerskis was highly respected, not only by military personnel, but also by a great majority of the Latvian people. He held such personal respect and trust that even the Germans had to accept Bangerskis as the actual representative of the Latvian people and their national interests, end quote. Sometimes the Germans would try to overstep their mark and arbitrarily draft Latvian civilians for military services in Kurzeme later in the war, but the Inspector General would also intervene to look out for their best interests and make sure things proceeded in a proper manner. It is also worth mentioning the efforts of the Latvians themselves to support their legionnaires. Silgailis writes about the topic briefly at the end of his book. I'll quote it in full. Quote, Prior to the organising of the Latvian Legion, the Committee of the Latvian Volunteers Organisation, directed by Gustavs Kelemins, administered the national welfare of Latvian order police units. The organisation also financed and published a newsletter called Dogavasi Vanagi, or Hawks of the Daugava River. With the assembling of the Legion, needs arose for national welfare on a much broader scale. A new Latvian relief organisation for servicemen, named Latvizu Karavirsu Paliziba, aka LKP, was established. The organisation was assigned to the Director General of the Interior, but in its relief activities it was directed by the Culture and Welfare Department Office of the Inspector General. The response of the Latvian people was tremendous. For instance, the donations for the first selected radio concert for the benefit of the Legion amounted to close to 1 million Reichsmark, the organisation collected donations, gift parcels and other items, erected and maintained rest homes and clubs for servicemen, organised entertainment and concerts in the battle zones as well as at home. The newsletter Dorgavas Fanagi was proclaimed to be the official newspaper of the Latvian Legion. The publisher was the Inspector General, but LKP financed it. Early in October 1944, the LKP was moved to Germany and located in two different areas, Dresden and Schwerin. Unfortunately, the Dresden branch and its supplies were lost in the Western Allies air raid on Dresden on the night of February 1314, 1945. The Schwerin branch was moved to Lübeck late in April of 1945, where it continued relief work for Latvian refugees after the capitulation of Germany until its resources were exhausted. Besides donations to the LKP, the Inspector General received donations from businesses, organisations and municipalities directly. Also, almost every unit of the Legion had its own sponsor from local industries or municipalities. In May 1944, an agreement was reached between the Inspector General and the SS Hauptamt concerning the publishing of a monthly magazine, Nakotne, aka Future. This magazine was edited by the Inspector General and financed by the SS. Oberführer Hugo Vitols was appointed chief editor and prominent scientists, writers and artists were on the staff. The magazine was one of the most popular Latvian magazines published at that time. Even though the medical staff of Latvian units were Latvian, there arose a need for a Latvian hospital since many were not able to communicate in German. On December the 13th, 1943, the Latvian Labour Union donated cash, 250 beds and all the appliances for this purpose. This was the largest donation received and a hospital was established in Riga. Obersturm Führer Leidins was appointed chief of the hospital. The hospital was moved to Germany during the evacuation of the capital in the fall of 1944. 
After overcoming great difficulties, it reopened in Schwerin. Prior to the takeover of Schwerin from the Russians from the British, the hospital was moved to Lübeck, where it provided medical care to Latvian refugees until 1951. The Inspector General was informed on July 12, 1944, that the Reichsführer SS Himmler had permitted the wearing of awards from the former Estonian and Latvian army. Also, Latvian nurses who worked in German hospitals were allowed to wear the Latvian arm shield. Unlike most of the Waffen SS, the 6th SS Army Corps had a Catholic priest and each Latvian division a Lutheran priest within their ranks. End quote. And then, of course, there is the fate of the men themselves. In all, Silgailis estimates that around 148,000 Latvians signed up in all between the various different divisions, border guard units, police units, or other units or organizations, such as the Todd organization. In all, this is around 8% of the entire Latvian population. On top of this, he doesn't count the Latvians who voluntarily joined with German units and organizations prior to the creation of the Legion. If you add those in, you're looking at an absolutely mind-boggling amount of people contributing to the war effort of a tiny country which officially didn't even exist as a state, and officially wasn't even at war. In the end, those that were left in Kordzeme obviously ended up suffering at the hands of the Soviets, which was of course particularly brutal, even by Soviet standards, given that the Latvians were meant to be Soviet citizens. Many of them simply fled to the forests and took up an armed guerrilla struggle. Collectively, these were known as the Forest Brothers, and in all three Baltic states, they were prevalent for decades after the war's end. Those in Germany, both civilians and military alike, ended up in either internment camps or refugee camps. As time passed, and the Allies realized that their policy of friendship with the Soviets was at best naive and at worst absolutely insane, they began to see the logic of the Latvians, and many Latvian SS men ended up becoming so trusted that they were actually brought in to help guard the prisoners at Nuremberg. The previous men had been Poles, and they were absolutely brutal with the men they were meant to be guarding. The arrival of the Latvians was much welcomed by those awaiting their fates. As the years passed, more and more Latvians found more friends abroad. The US took up the mantle of anti-communism from the Germans after seeing the horrors for themselves, and as a result, the US was destination number one that the Latvians wished to go to. Programs were set up, and sponsors were found in the US so that these people could come over and immediately contribute to society. In the end, the US absorbed tens of thousands of Latvians alone. Second choice was usually places like Canada or Australia. Especially sought after were hard-working men. The last to go were many of the legionnaires themselves. After all, they had fought on the side of Germany. As the tensions eased post-war, however, they were able to move much like their families and friends had from the civilian population. Many just ended up staying in Germany, as they had grown rather fond of the place. Many wouldn't live to see their country's independence, but many did. In 1991, after a long struggle, the Baltic states were once more granted independence, and many legionnaires, now old men, were able to return home to a hero's welcome. The prism in which Latvians view the Second World War is very different to our own in the West. From the outside looking in, we mostly see the crimes of Hitler's Germany, as they were our enemy. Churchill decided to jump into bed with Stalin, and Soviet crimes were actively suppressed. In fact, Churchill was even suspected of having many people killed just to appease Stalin, such as the Polish leader in exile, General Sikorsky. The British people simply were not told the truth of the Eastern Front. The Latvians saw it for themselves though, and in their eyes the Latvian Legion were freedom fighters against communism. The initial Soviet occupation saw crimes beyond description. Tens of thousands of Latvians were shipped off east with no regard for their health. On the way, people would freeze to death or die of starvation, and they were simply thrown out of the rail cars and left to rot on the side of the tracks. Latvian nationalists were especially targeted, and Latvian identity in general was put under endless pressure. The goal was to absorb the Latvians into the greater Soviet whole. After the war, things were even worse. Tens of thousands more men, women and children were deported to the east, and hundreds of thousands of Russians were brought in to take their places. The goal here was to erase Latvian identity. Despite all these hardships, however, Latvians still exist, but the country isn't perfect, and the leftover effects from communism are still obvious to all. The government is currently trying to deport the Russian population that can't speak Latvian, but at the end of the day, these people aren't the settlers who came before. Are they guilty just because they descend from Russians who came to Latvia? On the other hand, the Latvians just want their country back. Even their capital of Riga was majority Russian until very recently. It's a very confusing situation, and there is no correct answer. Either way, the ethnic tension is noticeable, especially given recent events in Ukraine. Silgailis ends his book better than I can end the video. Quote, It is regrettable that despite the great effort and human sacrifice given by the Latvian people, their country could not be saved from a second Soviet Union occupation. The Latvian soldiers fought desperately to the very end, 
They did not fight for any foreign ideology or interest, but simply for the freedom of their homeland and its people." End quote. The reality for Latvia was that Hitler's crusade in the East was her only chance at independence. Whether making a deal with Hitler was worth it is up to you. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did make it this far, then please do leave a like or share it. It means a lot. As always, the biggest thanks of all goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members. Without their invaluable support, I would not be able to make these videos for a living, and I cannot thank them enough. If you do want to support the channel, join our Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do click one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can imagine. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to you, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Gaius Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rock Saka Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig1919, Gloomy, Troy Harsa, Jagd Kampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, Espen, Khan, Luca Marincic, Veritas Unleashed, The Real G, Joel, Ghost0128, Jack, Bobby Atkinson, John DeGrief, Ward, Crankless, Dramatic Equation, Russ Hale, Senator Armstrong, Lucas Drury, Mark Smith, Shameful Display, Sneed Seed and Feed, Bruno, Emma Magishmail, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, Charlie Black, Will from Florida, History by Grayscale, The Waller, Suma Klubayek, Jorgen1997, and Admiral Kempinski.